The first thing you notice is the large figure in the center. He's the king. And we know that because he's wearing the tall white crown of Upper Egypt. In his hand, he holds a mace, basically a rock on a stick. And he is about to smash his captive, whom he holds by the hair. I can tell you the king's name. It's Narmer, perhaps the very first king of unified Egypt. You'll see how I know that in a minute. Above the captive is a falcon holding the head of another captive by a nose ring. The falcon is the symbol of the pharaoh. The six papyrus plants that come out of the stylized body of the captive may be hieroglyphs for 6,000. Each plant is 1,000 in hieroglyphs. So Narmer may have taken 6,000 enemy and defeated them. That's the headline, but there's lots more to say. Look at what Narmer is wearing, a kilt. And coming down its back is a bull's tail, a symbol of his power. He also wears a false beard, another symbol of authority. You can even see the chin strap holding it on. Now look behind Narmer at the smaller figure. It's his sandal bearer. And I think he's carrying a pot of water for when the pharaoh gets thirsty. Behind that little guy are the hieroglyphs for the word servant. The hieroglyph on top is traditionally called a rosette, but it appears to be flower petals of some sort. The hieroglyph beneath it is a small club. These are very early hieroglyphs, carved at the beginning of the written ancient Egyptian language, so we aren't exactly sure what they mean, but we have a good idea. The rosette appears in front of other kings' names, so my bet is it means king. The little club in later Egyptian texts means servant, so the little guy with the sandals is the king's servant. But don't think he's just a lowly servant. He is actually an important official. Around his neck, he's got a cylinder seal on a cord. This shows he was high up in the hierarchy. Also, just being represented on the pallet must have been a great honor. Behind the captive may be the name of the town he comes from. We're not sure. Remember, these are very early hieroglyphs carved around 3100 BC, right at the beginning of writing. Beneath Norma's feet are two fleeing enemies, with their towns apparently indicated by the hieroglyphs above them. Now, how do I know the king's name is Narmer? Look at the top. Two representations of a cow goddess look down on the scene, perhaps in approval. But between them is a rectangular structure called a serech that represents the facade of a palace. There are doors and windows. Inside that rectangle are two hieroglyphs. The one on top is a catfish, which was pronounced nar in ancient Egyptian. Beneath it is a chisel, pronounced mer, nar mer. That's how the first king's name was pronounced. Now, let's look at the second side of the palette to see the end of the event commemorated. The second side of the palette has the same top with the cow goddesses and the name of Narmer in the palace facade. Beneath it, however, we have something different, a procession, a victory procession. Narmer is now wearing a different crown, the short red crown of Lower Egypt. He came from the south, conquered the king of the north, and now rules both north and south. Egypt is unified. His name is very prominent in front of him, Narmer. In the procession that precedes him is a figure that's larger than the others. The hieroglyphs above him are not his name. They mean vizier or prime minister. I think you can see his stoop posture. That's because he's wearing a leopard skin. It's the sign of a high priest, and it's not an easy garment to wear. It's not tailored. So he's bent over, holding the heavy garment on. The smaller figures hold standards. 
perhaps the divisions or towns from which the army came. They're walking towards decapitated bodies that have their hands tied. Don't mess with Narmer. Beneath this procession, we see two mythological animals with their necks intertwined. This is unusual. They appear only in a few other times in Near Eastern art, and we don't know exactly what the beasts represent. Here, they may well symbolize the unification of the two powerful lands. At the very bottom of the palette is a bull, simultaneously breaking down a walled city where he tramples on the enemy. The bull is yet another symbol of the pharaoh. The Narmer palette is important for several reasons. Because of its historical content, and because it's very early writing describing the beginning of Egypt as a great nation. But it's also important to ancient Egyptian art. It sets standards, conventions, that would be followed for 3,000 years. First, it shows hierarchical proportions. The more important people are shown larger. Just look at Narmer on the front compared with everyone else. Second, the smiting of the enemy pose will be the logo for Egypt, the very symbol of the country. It appears on temples for the next 30 centuries. Third, the falcon and the bull will also reappear over and over again as emblems of kingship. Fourth is the practice of placing the action on registers. People don't just float around, they stand on something. The palette is divided into sections, which makes it easier to read. As I mentioned before, the Narmer palette is a very early example of Egyptian writing. If you think about the hieroglyphs on the palette, you'll see that they're not sentences. They're really more like labels. They give Narmer's name, the vizier's title, perhaps the captive's name. They don't tell a full narrative. We have to fill in the blanks, guess at the full story. Everyone always assumed that both sides were coughed at the same time to commemorate a single event. This may not be correct. Let me tell you about something I noticed on the palette that suggests that possibly we don't have the right story. Years ago, I was waiting for someone at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and he was late. We were supposed to meet at the Norma Palette, and since I knew he would be late, I decided to use the time to take a very close look at the Norma Palette's hieroglyphs. As I looked at both sides, I became convinced that I recognized two distinct handwritings one on one side of the palette, one on the other. Let's look at the rosette next to the sandal bearer. See how it's drawn on two sides. One side has seven petals, and on the other, only six. This is a handwriting. The same person isn't going to write the hieroglyph so differently. Two different people did this. Also, look at the serech, the palace facade, See how simply, almost crudely, it's drawn on the reverse side? Compare that with the other side. Much more complete. Even Norma's name is drawn differently on the two sides. The catfish in his name is quite different from side to side. I am absolutely convinced that the two sides were carved by two different artists. The question is why? I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps one side was carved and then some time elapsed, and it was decided to carve the second side? Now for the even bigger question. Which side was carved first? I have an idea. It's a half-baked idea, but I think it's interesting. My guess is that the side with the intertwined mythological beasts was carved first. After all, it's a palette, and where the necks intertwine is the only suitable place for grinding cosmetics. Sometime later, the second side was carved. So that would mean that what we've been calling the front is the reverse. We may be telling the story backwards. I'm far from sure about this, but what is clear is that if you know a bit about hieroglyphs, 
you will look more closely at them and see things that others miss. Anyway, the Narmer palette definitely shows us just how important the king is in Egyptian civilization. This also led to the development of writing. 